I think it'll this will be okay. Like once it has weight on it, it holds. Yeah, yeah. You sure? Yeah. You want to do it again? It's okay. Yeah. If it doesn't hold, I'll just put it on the ground and pretend like you know these things don't bother me.
Well, good morning and welcome to Banff Park Church. We are uh, live and real here this morning. Many of you, of course, are tuned in. We've got to today's live uh, live stream going on, and of course, online uh, church with our video chat is up and running uh, from our website, BanffParkChurch.com. So uh, if uh, you're home alone and you got something to say, you can always uh, chat with us uh, uh, and it looks as though though things may be getting better out there. Everything I'm hearing, uh, we're looking forward to having more people here. But thank you for those of you who have come this morning. Our numbers are limited, so uh, but it, it's fun to have some people here. Um, you know, do things get better? Look at the weather outside. This is just unbelievable. 21 degrees yesterday, sunny, not a cloud in the sky, barely. It's been fantastic. Uh, the NHL playoffs are starting. Uh, not to, The Oilers are in. I'm pretty happy about that, actually. It's a pleasant change. So that's that's really good, you know. And uh, it, it's funny, you know, in, in not only our couple study, but in our men's study, we've been ta- talking about, you know, attaching blame and and, and, and blaming, taking on the blame yourself. You know, take the plank out of your own eye before your brothers. And, and you know, it all, things like this always come to mind. So two days ago, I'm washing the mud off my Jeep, and all of a sudden, the water stops. I mean, stops. So I go, I, I panic. I run in the house. I check that, that it, I don't have an exploded pipe in the house. I'm checking my taps to make sure everything else is running. And I go, wow, this, this is really weird. I turn the tap on and off. I move the handle in and out on the hose. Something's wrong, and I think right away, attach blame. Okay, who built my house? <laughs> and who would be the only person that would know how to turn the water off to outside? Randy Tarchuk. <laughs> so I will tell you, I go in the house and say, that bugger, can I say bugger in church? Sorry. Anyways, he is in there and he's turning the water off and he's hiding. So I'm running around my house, opening closets, looking in, looking around, looking behind doors, checking everything out, going, what the heck is going on? Turns out the nozzle was broken. Um, so... All for naught, and I'm trying to attach blame, and really, he wasn't even in the province. Uh, so, anyways, it's just sort of the way it goes, isn't it? But, uh, anyways, so again, you know, we're, we're uh, back live, and uh, if you'd like to attend service, please give us a call and uh, check in. Call Greg, and uh, he will make sure that you can get here. Uh, boy, it would sure be nice to have a few more people again uh, coming up. And, and like I say, that... Uh, probably will be coming so it'll be uh, that'll be great we've got uh, new stuff happening as well um, in our side room I call it Ryan's room because every time I come here he's over there um, we got a new uh, live stream screen and camera set up over there so when we can get together and we're full here we can set all sorts of chairs up over there, and people can sort of see over here, but they can see everything on the screen over there, too. So that's really exciting. We've been talking and thinking about that for years, uh, and it uh, is really something. So anyways, if you are in quarantine, please reach out if you need anything, medication, groceries, uh, anything at all. Um, you want to talk? Uh, give us a call, and uh, we'd be more than happy to uh, give you a hand with that. It'd be uh, it'd be great to uh, get together and do the and uh, and be able to help you on that. So and uh, food to go. Well, when the food bank ends, so does food to go. But we go until about the end of June. So that's June twenty eighth, twenty ninth, right in there will be our last time. And you know, I've had people clamoring, saying, "How can I help with that food to go?" You know, it's just been they've been lined up, and it's just, no problem. You want to give a hand? Come and see me or Jim or Celine at the back who run the program. It's been very well received. We've given away all of the chili that we've made. That's about 50 people have taken uh, serving a chili over the last few weeks. And uh, it's good. And it's appreciated in our community. People in our community aren't quite back to work yet. So uh, this is a service that uh, we are really uh, able to help with here at Banff Park Church. And thanks to Jim and Selena for putting that together with us, for us. So uh, that's uh, been really good. So that's it. I always mention all of our programs with the men's, the ladies, couples, married couples. Um, you know, we've got all programs available to you 
online. So uh, sign up, give us a call, connect, and uh, let's, uh, let's uh, you know, it'd be fun. To, it's always fun to get together. With our couple study, we are getting to be a really tight-knit group. And uh, it's really fun and interesting to know that, you know, my t- troubles are this. But when I talk to all the other couples, they're having the sort of the same issues. And it's nice to know you're not in the boat alone. So uh, anyways, great to get together and talk about all that stuff. So so again, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thanks for tuning in this morning. And we're going to ask Jordan to come on up and, and share worship for us. Thank you. Morning. So confession, um, <laughs> I'm meeting um, some. I'm e- meeting up with my mother to get some plants this afternoon, and she may forget that I'm at church right now and message me on my iPad, which is gonna like make a very loud noise right at the front here. So if you hear anything, it's my mother's fault. <laughs> Whoa, that's not right. Sorry about that. Do you guys want to stand up so we can sing together?
know, I have a lot of happy songs this morning. I think it's the weather. I set up a greenhouse yesterday, so I'm good. <laughs> Probably have to put a heater in it, but you know.
guys can be seated. Thank you, Jordan and Shayla. Sorry, Shayla, I forgot you on the intro there. Bad me, but anyways. Anyways, we are so fortunate uh, to be here. Uh, it's, it's, uh, we, we are missing Clara and, uh, and Marna and, and uh, Don Sr. Biggie, um, who really are the cornerstones of our church. And uh, they've been here like, well, longer than I have, so that's forever. Uh, and uh, we just want to reach out to you and uh, who can't be here today, including those three, and say, you know, welcome virtually, and uh, we miss you, and we look forward to uh, seeing you back here real soon. Um, you know, when I speak of fortunate, I have a friend who lives in Tel Aviv, and I emailed him this week and um, said, what the heck? Like, are you guys okay? And he says, well, you know, they live in, in right on the outskirts of Tel Aviv. So they seem to be out of the main firing line. So he says he always sleeps well at night, but his wife is up many times in the evening with the sirens going for the air raids. Uh, so it is a great time of unrest in many parts of the world, uh, in particular there right now. So uh, our uh, prayers are with them as well. So let's uh, start our uh, service with prayer. So if you bow with me. Lord, thanks. Um, we are safe and well-fed and doing well. You've given us a beautiful place and all that we really do need, Lord. And we give you the credit for that. Thank you. Lord, I pray that you are with the elders of our church. Um, and when I say the elders, not only Lee is our official elder, but Clara, Marna, and Biggie, and, you know, those who can't be here, touch them this morning, Lord, as well. We, we desire to see them here again one day, Lord, when it's safe to do so, and, uh, and we look forward to that, Lord. We praise you for their well-being today, Lord, so thank you. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've given us. Lord, we pray for those around the world living in areas of distress and worry and fear. Um, so many in India and so many in, in Israel and, and uh, the West Bank, Lord. Um, wow. You know, we're so lucky. We can't even relate, Lord. But, Lord, you can. So I pray that you are there, Lord, in touching souls. So thank you, Lord. Be with us in this service, Lord. Um, touch us, teach us, use Greg as you would, uh, you would have your will be done, Lord. So thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Greg? Ought to be a better way than that. All right. Good morning. Now, I just want to pick on uh, Clara and Marna just for a second, because if we if we have our two how do I say this nicely most senior folks that are watching us and interacting online every week, certainly, certainly we can all. Uh, learn something from them and their tech savviness, if, if you know. But 90, what is, is Claire 96 now? Is that right? 95, 96? If, if, if Clara can figure out how to join us online and talk to us online, then certainly the rest of us can figure it out too. So a testament to them. Uh, you can open to 1 Corinthians 11 uh, this morning. This is a tough one, so let's, uh, let's pray first. God, thank you for this morning, and thank you for uh, this text that we're going to read this morning, and, and God, we know there are difficult and challenging passages in the Bible, but, but we know they're your words written to us, and so would you give us the courage uh, to study hard, to learn 
what you are trying to say to us? Would we have open hearts, open minds, so that we can receive your words? So God, give me wisdom here as I try and make this uh, clear to us now this morning. Amen. So th- this is, how many have read ahead? Excellent. Okay, good. Very few of us. Uh, I've, I've been up on the roof with Merv a couple of days, and, and he was reading ahead, and he's just laughing the whole time, going, how are you going to deal with this one, Greg? And, uh, and so I told him, whatever you say on the roof, can and will be used against you. So I may or may not quote Merv a few times today. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I won't do that. But, but I could. If you ever want to laugh, I mean, if you want to hurt too physically, because it's hard work, but if you want to laugh, just go up on the roof with Merv. You will hear more Irish hymns sung than you have in your whole life. It's hilarious. Uh, it's fun. So this morning here, as we start, I want to, this is going to be a big preamble, a big explanation, a big contextual clarification before we actually even get anywhere. So I'm going to try and stick to my notes here because I'm like 30% longer than normal, and that's probably a problem. So, so let's, let's look at a couple of things here. So this passage, verses 2 to 16 of chapter 11, is often... It, considered by commentators and theologians, uh, one of the most controversial passages in all of the Bible. So I don't know what I was thinking when I decided to preach through 1 Corinthians 11. And then as I kept going, I realized, oh, there's a few more sections like this. The first 10 chapters were, were, were much easier to deal with. Uh, but then I started to think, and, and like I prayed a moment ago, is all of these words we believe are from God. They're his words to us. And so if we read them and we get upset or we get confused, uh, the issue is not with God. The issue is with us. And so we need to strive to understand them better. And sometimes we get to passages like this one and we go, man, this is tough. I'm, I'm just going to move on. And I'm just not even going to deal with it. Not even going to, I'm just, I don't understand it. So we'll just keep going. And, and I think we do a disservice uh, to ourselves and to the word of God when, when we approach the word that way. Because the reality is, is these questions are going to be asked of us. When we're interacting with non-Christians who perhaps uh, have grown up where they've heard some scripture, they know some of the Bible, but they've heard some of these passages and, and they've never really learned what they mean or gone deep into it and tried to figure out what is God saying. And so they use these as reasons why I, I don't want to be a Christian. And then why would you be a Christian if, and if we just simply go, man, I just don't know, that's a tough one, we'll just move on. I, I think that's dangerous. Now, I think it's equally as dangerous to think we have all the answers. And so we're going to approach this with, with a, I hope, a lot of humility, uh, recognizing that there are some things in here and a specific verse that I'll get to that I'm not really sure how to interpret. Uh, I don't know. I think I have some ideas. Uh, but there are other p- parts of these verses that I think are not as confusing as perhaps we sometimes make them. And, and I'll explain uh, that as we get there. But so my goal here is that we're going to look at what the big picture idea is that is happening, not focusing on the details too much, but trying to step back from it so we see the overall theme of what's happening, but without ignoring the details. So that sounds simple, right? No problem. So we'll, we'll do both of those. Now, Chapter 8 to chapter 10, which we have finished now, is kind of one section, and then chapter 11 starts a new section. But in this new section, some of what we've been talking about in chapters 8, 9, and 10, the the principles found in there are just as relevant to here. So I don't want us to think we're in a new section, totally new frame of thought. There are some new things in it, but the overall idea continues uh, to be the same. So what did we talk about? Well, in chapter 8, we started with this idea of meat sacrificed to idols. And then we move forward into the, re- 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 the realization that what Paul's trying to get us to realize is that if we focus on our rights, what we think we deserve, the, the you know, I'm going to do this because I technically should be allowed to, and we don't think about other people, that we're actually standing condemned already because them the other brother, the other sister, those in our church family, we should be far more concerned with them than with us. 
I mean, that's kind of Christianity in a nutshell in some ways, isn't it? Is that Jesus, at the cost of his life, gave so that we could live. It was, it's all about the other person, giving the other person, and, and it's no different for us. And so uh, Paul's focus in chapters 8 and 9 and 10 was so much on that, and he deals with meat and when you should eat meat and when you shouldn't eat meat, and, and overall the whole idea of idolatry. And I guess what I'm trying to say is this, is in chapters 8, 9, and 10, there's a lot in there that we read, we see what the big picture ideas are. We see what's being taught to us and what things we need to apply, but we also recognize what issues are just cultural and aren't really relatable or applicable for us. Applicable is that a word? Applicable. Uh, so we think of it this way, as we read a section in eight of meat sacrifice to idols, well, most of us are not being like, oh, this is relevant now, I gotta, I gotta know, right? That's not something that we in our culture deal with very much at least not here. But that doesn't mean that all of a sudden it's irrelevant, and so we study through it, we read through it, and we try and figure out what God is saying to us. And so that's the, the precursor for as we enter into chapter 11 that I want to say, is this is a cultural thing that was happening uh, in the church of Corinth at that time, and we're going to try and deal with that as best as we can. But the overall idea of what is being taught is just as relevant to us today. So if we think, like last week, idolatry, well, we don't worship idols maybe the same way in, in this part of the world that they did back then. But what about materialism? Couldn't materialism be just as serious of an idol to us, right? An idol is anything that replaces God, anything that takes precedent, anything that we wake up in the morning, we think about and go, I need that, and we ascribe our worship to it, whether it's intentional or unintentional, that becomes an idol. And so there's, idolatry is a massive problem in our culture. It just looks a little bit different than it did back then. Paul finished by saying this, the end of chapter 10. He says, all things are lawful, but not all things build up. So that could be the Christian mantra for us. Is there should be two questions that we always ask. Is One, does this honor and bring glory to God? This thing that I'm about to do, this right that I have, the way that I'm going to speak, you know, etc. Is does it bring honor and glory to God? And then secondly, Will it edify my brothers and sisters in the Lord? Will it build up the church? Those are the two things that we should always be asking. And so in the same way, now we move into this unique area of where Paul's going to talk about worship. And specifically, there's three things in chapters 11 and 12 that he deals with. And first is this issue of women wearing head coverings. And again, even saying that, I can just tell like some people are like, oh, hold on, what? Uh, but we'll talk about that. Then we're going to deal with uh, uh, the misuse of the Lord's Supper. And, and so, again, that's something we celebrate communion every month together. It should be a very familiar passage. And yet we're going to see that the way in which they were approaching it was actually very, very wrong and, and was at the expense of many in the church. Uh, and, and so we're going to look at that. And then in chapter 12, we're going to look at spiritual gifts, how God has created us, what gifts he's given to us, and what those gifts are meant to be used for Here's the spoiler alert. What is it for? The edification of the church. So in this passage that we're going to read here, the issue at hand is worship. Specifically, uh, uh, an issue that they dealt with at that time that we maybe don't uh, deal with as much today. But that doesn't mean that the principles that underlie all these things aren't true. Now, just before we read this, I also want to say this. Sometimes the way in which we approach a text, I shouldn't say sometimes, I think all the time, when we approach a text, our own cultural upbringing is speaking. It's how we've been raised, the church that we've grown up in. Uh, it impacts the way in which we think and then the way in which we interpret some of these passages. And so after we read this, I'm going to spend a, a bit of time explaining to you from my position where I come from so that you can see how I'm interpreting it and I'm not really going to try and show you why I think that's the correct way to interpret it, though that will pop in a little bit. Um, but my goal is to show you that here's why I have reached a certain way. Not to, not to try and defend that specific way, but just so that you understand where I'm coming from. So let's, let's just read these verses together. Uh, verses 2 to 16 of chapter 11. It says this, Now I commend you, because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions, even as I delivered them to you. 
But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. Since it is the same as it sorry, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is a disgrace for a wife to cut off her hair, or shave her head, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was a man created for woman, but woman was for man. This is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head, because of the angel. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man independent of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman. And all things are from God. Judge for yourselves. Is, is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him, but if a woman has long hair, it is her glory? For her hair is given to her for, sorry, her hair is given to her for a covering. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. Real simple, right? No problem. We'll just, we'll just read it again and then go home and no problem. Um, again, right, you read this and trepidation and fear fills you and goes, I actually have to talk about this now. Uh, but actually, honestly, that, that's not the case, right? Because, like I said, these are the words of God. I, I don't fear talking about them. I don't fear reading them. Uh, but I do take very seriously that God has called me to try and help communicate these things. And, and there's some stuff in there that at first glance or first read, you're kind of like, what? Like, I'm, I'm not even sure what Paul's saying, let alone what he means. So let's deal with this a little bit. Now, again, yes, it's confusing. Yes, it's a little bit uh, controversial, but we can get through it. So let's just, uh, m maybe let's think of it this way. Is let's try and step back from our preconceived notions about what we just think we heard and just slow down. Uh, and, and we'll take a little bit at a time and try to figure this out. But again, before we do that, I want to give you a couple of quotes here. Richard Pratt summarizes this whole section by saying this, and I'm going to have several quotes as we go through here because I think they do a really good job of explaining these things. So Richard Pratt summarizes it by saying this, Put simply, we do not seem to realize that worship is a time to honor other people. We come to worship Christ, but we could care less about the others who join us in worship. But the fact is that we cannot honor Christ in worship while we dishonor our fellow worshipers. That's his summarization of it. I think that's beautifully put. Is when we come together as the corporate church, so the, the assembly of Christ, we gather together. If it's more about me and God and less about everybody else, then we've missed out on what the corporate assembly is for. It's a corporate thing. Yes, our relationship with God is a deeply and meaningful personal thing, but if it's only a deeply meaningful personal thing and it doesn't extend into the body, then we've misunderstood the whole concept of what the church is for. And so when we think of it, if we see somebody worshiping a different way than us, or, and this is especially real for us in Banff, is people from all over the world will come and, and on any given Sunday, right, COVID notwithstanding, on any given Sunday, somebody would come here from a different part of the world and worship in a different way, pray in a different way, and we see those things, and our response is, and how am I going to deal with that? If we lash out with anger or judgment or frustration and go, well, they shouldn't be, well, that's, and we get all fixated on what we think is correct and right, is how are we honoring God? If we're casting judgment and condemnation towards people while trying to sing joyful, joyful, Lord, we adore thee, is we're kind of missing the whole point. And the fact that we don't see that is, is deeply troubling. Now, I'm not pointing fingers at anybody here. We are all uh, guilty of this from time to time. Corporate worship is, uh, and this is, right, chapter 11 and 12, Paul's going to be continually showing that corporate worship is a necessity. It's something essential in our Christian experience, something that we, as we learn from one another how to honor and glorify God, we grow, and as a corporate body, as the church, we bring him the most honor, the most glory. And I think 
when we can put aside our unique little differences and we can corporately gather together and worship, that that brings God so much more honor. Shayla and I had a unique experience, and we're hopefully going to have the same experience next year, is when we were in South Africa, there was a church uh, in this place called Mshlanga, and, uh, and it was a large church, but it was a very diverse church. And we went a couple of Sundays, and one Sunday, we're, we're there, and, and we're pretty familiar with the songs, but all of a sudden, on the stage, there's, there's a rapper. I grew up in Steinbeck, okay, right? Like, like this is a little bit awkward. Can one rap and worship Jesus? Like, I don't know, right? Like, of course they can, right? But we get stuck in our minds. And sitting here watching, and, and there's people from all ethnic backgrounds, all socioeconomic backgrounds of all kinds, and they're all just worshiping together, and nobody, at least from our perspective, seemed to care less about your preference, my preference, the fact that this person's rapping those lyrics, the fact that this person's singing them. Everyone is just worshiping God together. And, and it, for a moment, it felt like, man, this is what heaven's going to be like. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation, all gathered, all with our unique differences, because I think God has created us uniquely different because it brings him honor and glory. But we get so stuck in our unique things. And, and so in that moment, that was something for me. And so Shayla and I and Smonger are going to go back to Africa, you know, assuming covid moves on from our lives. Uh, we're going to go back in March, and I'm really excited to go back and to see what's this church like now, right? Almost 10 years later. Is it, is it kind of the same kind of thing? Uh, I'm, I'm really excited for that. So now let's start to deal with, that was the preamble. We're done that. Now we're going to deal with the contextualization of this passage. Our church um, specifically in our denomination as a whole, we hold to a complementarian position of gender roles within the church. So I'm going to explain a little bit about that, but my focus is not necessarily to try and defend that, like I said, uh, because that would be a whole morning. And, you know, this summer, we're going to do a little questions in the box series, and if you want clarification on this and you want, man, I, I want to hear what, like, defend this position more, more at length, then by all means, we can do that then. But I I'm trying to explain this so that you can see that as we come to these verses, there is a biblical context from which I'm coming to these verses. I'm not just choosing uh, to respond to them however I feel. So uh, I'm going to give you a lengthy quote from a pastor theologian named Sam Storms here uh, who defines complementarianism, I think, probably the most helpful way, but it's a bit of a lengthy one, so stay with me here. He writes this, Men and women are together created in the divine image and are therefore equal before God as persons, possessing the same moral dignity and value, and have equal access to God through faith in Christ. Men and women are together the recipients of spiritual gifts designed to empower them for ministry in the local church and beyond. Therefore, women are to be encouraged, equipped, and empowered to utilize their gifting in ministry in the service to the body of Christ." and through teaching in ways that are consistent with the word of God, this principle of male headship should not be confused with, nor given any hint of, domineering control. Rather, it is to be the loving, tender, and nurturing care of a godly man who is himself under the kind and gentle authority of Jesus Christ. The elders Elders slash pastors of each local church have been granted authority under the headship of Jesus Christ to provide the oversight and to teach and to preach the word of God in corporate assembly for the building up of the body. The office of elder and pastor is restricted to men. So that's the overall view of, from which we approach the scriptures. Now again, um, the way in which you grew up, right, for better or worse, there's always positives and negatives from every kind of unique background. But sometimes when we read those things, when we read a word like is restricted to men, immediately there's a sense of equality crying out. And so I understand that, and let me say it this way, is for probably most of us to varying degrees is we have grown up where social injustice is just a reality of our life. That doesn't make it right or good. It's just been part of it. And we have had to learn, and we've had to grow, and we've had to go through painful historical moments where some of these things get brought to light, fighting ensues, difficulties, all kinds of things. And this idea of women within the church has not been a very 
it hasn't been an easy journey. And there have been many denominations that do focus on the domineering patriarchal uh, aspect of things, and, and I, I, we don't as a church hold to those things. And so I just want to say this, if you are a woman that grew up in the church where you were felt, uh, where you felt like you were less than, you were not as valuable, your giftings were not as meaningful, that your place was not as important, whatever kind of other fill in the blanks we have, then I just want to say I'm sorry that's not the way that we view things here is we at this church believe that we are all created in the image of God, that we are all loved desperately by God, created uniquely for the corporate assembly so that we can encourage and build one another up. That being said, the complementarian position does believe from a study of Scripture that while men and women are created equal in standing before God, they are created differently. If you've ever been married, you know this to be true in all kinds of ways. Here, in, in regards to this complementarian position, is there are certain differences, and we read about them right at the beginning of this text. And so what I want to say is this, is regardless of, if you grew up in a church where you were belittled, the proper response to that always should be, how can I grow and how can I learn actually what's correct and what's biblical and what, what my role is within the context of the local church. Sometimes in our efforts to deal with injustice, we swing too far to the other side. Uh, and so there is a position uh, that we've, I've mentioned a few times. It's called egalitarianism, where they say it's simply this, is outside of a biological difference that God has no difference between genders in Scripture. Now, again, my purpose for this morning is not to try and prove why I believe that is incorrect, uh, but to show you that how I'm interpreting these verses come from a complementarian theological standpoint. So again, I'm happy to go into that further or, or have conversation one-on-one -on -one with you and, and show you why I've biblically come to this conclusion, why our church has, why our association has, but I don't want to spend too much time there. So now let's begin into the text. So Paul says, I commend you, right, talking to the church here, right? So this is good news. He hasn't commended them all that much yet in, in the church in Corinth. I commend you because you remember me in everything and you maintain the traditions even as I, as I delivered them to you. So that's good. But then he says this, but I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband and the head of Christ is God. And so we all of a sudden have uh, a clarification here that while they're following the traditions, there are some within the church that are not and that are causing controversy, and Paul wants to correct some of these things. And so for us, we're, it's almost like we're missing a little bit of context. What exactly did this look like? And, and what does this mean? And, and some of these questions we don't really have as good answers to, but there's also some translation issues that we find here as well. So some of your translations may not say uh, the head of the wife is her husband, but it may be more generic as man and woman. Well, the ESV, I think, has done the best job of deciphering the context here and putting this framework in there, because there are times in the Bible where man or husband and wife and woman can be used interchangeably. And so, again, even in interpreting uh, or, or in translating scriptures, people make an interpretive uh, assumption in how they translate those things. So I think the ESV does a better job at showing the context here, and so I'm just clarifying that in case you see men and women, I think we're talking more in a specific context of relationship here. So the immediate uh, opposition is, I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. It seems like now we're dealing with an issue of equality right off the hop. At least that's what many people argue. But let me just read it one more time because I don't think there's any equality in here. I think there's just a misunderstanding. The head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. If we're arguing an issue of inequality, then we also have to argue an issue of inequality with the last part of that sentence, which is, says, the head of Christ is God. Is Christ inferior to the Father? 
is the son inferior to the father. Do we ever get that idea? When we think about this is, we read in Philippians that Jesus, and I have quoted this several times as we've gone through this because it's this idea of humility and Jesus putting others before himself, is he had all the power and all the authority and he didn't have to go to the cross, but he submitted himself to the will of the Father. He submitted himself to the will of the Father and went to the cross and in that act, all of mankind can now be reconciled to God. So argue with me how Christ is inferior. Like we can't. So the issue of equality isn't there. It's got to be something else. So Donald Pryor writes this. He says, this is the divine order. God, Christ, husband, wife. The husband is no more superior to his wife than God is superior to Christ. But as Christ chose to submit himself to his father, so the wife should, should, should submit herself to her husband. Now again, we don't like that word submit in our culture very much because it does have implications to it. And so we then approach that idea with going, hang on, submit means I am less than. But again, Scripture's full of where Christ submitted to the Father, so it can't be less than. I think of my, my brother when I think of an example like this because he's in the military, right? And so he is under authority of someone and he willingly submits himself to that person, though he certainly doesn't have to. It's not an issue of he's not powerful enough or not strong enough. It's an issue of this is what is right for me to do in this moment. And in our context here is this is what God has called uh, wives to do for husbands, but not so that husbands somehow become this overbearing, I get to do whatever I want thing. And sometimes that has happened. And that's where the problem then lies, is when a wife submits to her husband, if that husband takes power and control and authority out of that, so he demeans, well, then he's not doing the very thing that he is called to do, which in Ephesians 5 is what? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's a pretty high calling there, isn't it? That's a pretty, like, that's intense. Is literally, husbands, you do any and everything you can, and if it costs you your life to serve and honor and glorify your wife, then that is what you are called to do. So again, the issue, I think, is with our understandings of what some of these words have become to mean. Christ submitted to the will of the Father. In the Garden of Gethsemane, I would argue that is Christ's strongest moment when he says, not my will, but yours be done. I think it would have been far easier, and I think we can all relate in this, is sometimes when we're in the midst of some difficulty or some temptation, and we just go, man, it would just be so much easier just to give in and do what I want. So much harder to submit to the Holy Spirit and to do what is right. That doesn't make us inferior. That doesn't make us weak. That doesn't make us, we're giving strength. So what Paul is dealing with is that God has created a proper order for which things are to work. Paul wants wives to honor their husbands within the context of corporate worship. And as many commentators note, in that culture at that time, so at the church in Corinth, that male head coverings were done in pagan temples. And so Richard Pratt explains it this way. So when you go to the Old Testament, Aaron is the high priest is told to wear what? If you remember. A turban. Whenever you go into the temple, you're going to cover your head when you pray, when you minister, when you do all of these things. And so we learn that there's something happening in the Old Testament with that. But at the time that now this has happened is pagan temples are filled with men who cover their heads and then worshiped in that way. And now what we've learned is that Paul's saying, men, you need to stand out completely separate and different from culture. You need to worship in a way that does not mirror what the secular culture is doing, what others uh, are worshiping when they're not worshiping the one true God, but you need to stand out and to be different. And really, right, when we read, we're called to be holy. We're called to be completely other than the entire world around us is in fact, when we go through anything that we go through, the, the way in which we respond, the world should look at and go, that doesn't make sense. Why would you do that? Why wouldn't you just stand up for yourselves and fight back? Why would you, you know, why would you let someone strike the other cheek? 
That doesn't make sense. That's kind of the whole idea. Is it's all about Christ's grace, mercy, God's deep love for us. And when we humble ourselves and go, it's not about what I think I deserve. That's when all of these things start to happen. And isn't this true of most of our arguments that happen within relationships? Because I think I deserve something rather than thinking what should she or what should he deserve. It's the exaltation of self at the expense of somebody else. And that isn't just true in marriage. That's true in most of our relationships. Boss, employee. Is the employee thinks, I have a really good idea here, and boss won't listen to me, and so we act out in that because we don't feel heard, because we think, I should, I should, and maybe we should. But it's kind of not the point if we want to represent Christ. The point is, how are we going to respond to injustice? How are we going to respond to when we feel that we have been wronged? So I want to point out something else here. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors God. So that's the, the order that Paul says, this is how it should be for men. Now for women, every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. So the typical part that people get worked up about is the head covering, not noticing that there's an implication in the text that women are in the church there praying and prophesying. Like, do you see that? Because so often people will say that Paul has this misogynistic approach to women in the New Testament church and they, because we are going to deal with this in a few weeks where there's one comment where it says she is to be silent in the church and that's a very difficult one. We'll get there. There's a context to that. But here, his implication is if, not, I shouldn't say if, when a woman prays or prophesies, here is the way to do that that shows honor to their husbands within the context of the local church. So see that. Don't, don't miss it because it's so crucial to understand that. He kind of continues on making a point, and this can be a difficult one, right? Since it is the same, this is the last of verse 5, since it's the same as if her head were shaven, for if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut off her hair short. But since it's a disgrace for her to cut off her hair or shave her head, then let her cover her head, right? So Paul's not trying... He's not trying to say, if you're going to do this, well, then you have to do it this way, and then this is okay. He's not, he, it's like he's making an exaggerative point, right? Saying, if she's going to do this, it's dishonoring, and, and, and if she's going to do this, well, then you might as well do this. But you wouldn't dare do that because this is the implication. So again, let's deal with some of the cultural things here, right? Because if my wife was not allowed to shave her head a little while ago, then we would be in very big trouble. So obviously, we don't think this to be true in that sense. Right? So, and in the same way, when we get to chapter 8 and we talk about meat sacrifice to idols, we don't immediately get our backs up against the wall because we realize that's a cultural thing happening at a specific time in a specific place. We don't deal with those things, but there's truth to be found in there. Same is true here. It's just because there's been so much equality, and, and even within the church over the history, that our backs get up against the wall, we get defensive, and we miss what the point uh, of everything is being said, and we focus on some of these details. What's the focus? Remember, a cultural way of showing and res respect and honor to those in the corporate worship gathering. That's the context. Then we read, so now man is the glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. And so this seems to kind of undo all that, doesn't it? Hold on. What do we do with this? Well, let's go back to Richard Pratt. He says, Paul called woman the glory of their husbands, because this is one of their unique roles in the creation order. According to Genesis 2, 18 to 20, God created Eve to make it possible for the human race to fulfill the task originally given to Adam. For this reason, Moses called Eve a helper suitable for Adam. Moreover, the term suitable for means corresponding to or the mirror image of. Eve was the glory of Adam in a special way. With her joining Adam, the human race would become all that God had intended it to be. Both she and Adam would receive honor as a result. He finishes by saying this, This unique role held by Eve and her married female descendants gives wives a responsibility to bring honor or glory to their husbands. As a follower of Christ, all Christians must seek the good of others above their own. The, their, sorry, the special relationship between wives and husbands intensifies this responsibility. Because of this responsibility, wives were to honor, or sorry, wives are to honor their husbands in public worship. So Pratt argues, going back to the, again, this is not an issue of equality, but 
when God creates everything, right? He creates the stars and the sun and the, right, the plants and the animals and the trees, right? And what does he say every time? It's good. Then he creates Adam, and Adam is good, but then Adam is alone, and it is not good. And so God creates woman. And, and Paul's going to clarify this in a second here, and I'll read this uh, in a moment. But what you're seeing here is that there's a unique relationship that man was created completely from the dust, but then woman was created out of man. So it's not an issue uh, of some kind of equality, but Paul's simply going back and saying, look, this is the way in which God created. And you cannot like that all you want, but that's what God did. And so are we going to submit to that and we're going to say how God created is just and is right and is good. And even if I don't really understand some of this, if I feel like something is wrong, then the issue has got to be within my own heart and my own understanding of it. Because if we believe God is good, then we can't go back to the way in which he created and went, it's not good for Adam to be alone. I'm actually going to create a woman from Adam so that mankind can actually do the very thing that I've called and asked them to do. With, simply put, without woman, man couldn't have done what God created man to do. Let me read to you from Craig Keener because he points out something really good too. He says, according to Genesis 2.18, God created woman distinct from man partly so that man would no longer be alone. The phrase here translated helper, suitable, praises woman's strengths rather than subordinates her. And then listen to this, helper, which is the term that used that is often attacked in Genesis 2 and said this is some kind of a demeaning thing. Helper is used more often of God than anyone else in the Old Testament. Isn't that interesting? The same word that's used in Genesis to talk about Eve and her relationship with Adam is the same word that's used of God in how he helps his nation, Israel. So again, how is that an issue of inequality? How is that an issue of not enough? Is in fact, God is more patient and gracious than he ever should have been with his own nation, right? Forgiving, causing uh, when, they, when they rebelled, when they uh, worshipped other idols. Yes, there were consequences, but God continued to help his people, to draw them back to himself, to draw them into relationship with himself. So Craig Keener finishes by saying this. Um, suitable means corresponding to or appropriate to, as we've already discussed, uh, as an equal in contrast. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong sentence. <laughs> My bad. Let's try this again. Woman was thus created because man needed her strength, not as some have wrongly interpreted to be his servant. And this is the key, right? Is never do we find this idea that woman was created to be the servant to the man, but to be the helper to the man. And the helper was necessary to accomplish what God called them to do. And then we see so, uh, verse 8, Paul starts to create this relation. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. But neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. We're going to skip verse 10 because we're going to get back to it. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as the woman was made out of man, so man is now born of woman. So what do we see? Something very confusing, right? Uh, what we see is that God's saying neither are interdependent from one another, but they are both exist to work together to accomplish the thing that God has created for them to do. We need each other. And, and that's when, when you go back to the garden, when sin entered the world, and, and I'm not pointing fingers here, but when Eve ate the fruit, what did God say? Adam, what have you done? Right? So when you read back into there, as Adam had, given, had been given a role by God to care for his wife, and his wife was to help Adam, and Adam already fails. And then he has massive consequences that come from that. Then Eve is given consequences, but notice in those consequences, the very redemption of the world comes. Right? That's the first messianic prophecy, is that childbirth will now be painful, but in that childbirth, one will come, a seed from the woman who will defeat the enemy. 
And so when we think about it now, is, is man can sit there all they want and go, man, I am superior to woman. And the woman can look at him and go, without us, you don't exist, buddy. Right? Is, this, is the, this is God's way of showing our need for one another. We are intertwined far more than we ever could realize. Now, the argument being in the context of marriage and then marriage within the corporate assembly is that much more because the image of God, while created with man and woman, is meant to be uh, on full display in the context of that marriage. So, so if you are married, your marriage with your husband or with your wife is actually meant to display the most of God's glory through your image as you interact than anything else. So I always say it this way, is marriage is meant to represent Christ's covenant relationship with the church. So that's what your marriage is for, to show who God is, to show unconditional love and grace and mercy and humility. We don't do a very good job of that very often. I confess that, right? But that's the ideal. That's God's intent. That's what God is saying when he created them together, male and female. He created them. Okay, let's go back to 10, and then we'll finish off. Me and Merv were talking about this yesterday because he said, so what's your, what's your most controversial line? He loves the controversy. I'm just kidding. But he just asked, what's your most controversial line? And I said, you know what? Probably it's verse 10 because here's my line. Are you ready? We'll read it. This is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. What? I don't know. <laughs> Like, I really don't. I really struggled reading through all these commentaries, going to all these sources, trying to figure out, is there's no consensus here on exactly what Paul means. So there's some kind of a context that we're not privy to to understand kind of his point here. And so that's why sometimes it can be very difficult when we go, man, this is hard. I'm just going to move on and not deal with these things. I think even though they're hard, we've got to study and maybe we don't come to a complete conclusion, and maybe we have to hold it in our, or not maybe, we should hold all of these things in our hands, open, going, God, if I'm not correct here, would you please show me? Would you teach me? Would you discipline me if necessary? There's two interpretations that I think have a little bit more weight than the rest. One is this idea that uh, the word angels could is often the pardon me, the same word for messengers and angels are used interchangeably in the New Testament. And so it could be that Paul's saying, you need to behave this way because of the messengers that are there, because they're going to report back to me, not in the sense of like tattletale type of scenario, but in the sense of that Paul has planted this church and he cares desperately for them clearly. And he's trying to help them on their spiritual growth. And so there are those that are going to report back to him so that they can continue to be at work in this discipleship relationship. That's possible. The other aspect of this is that angels and mankind were different in, in a few ways, but one of those ways is that only mankind was created in the image of God. Right? And so we have this unique responsibility that we are... Christ's ambassadors. And so while the angels are at play, right? So think of it in the context of a spiritual reality, spiritual warfare that we find that we don't see all of, but we know there are angels at play. Their scripture talks about how they're given to us uh, for our uh, benefit, right? So they, they are at work for God in doing things and what that all looks like, right? So we say things like we have a guardian angel. My mom used to say my guardian angel was on overtime a lot right? How much of that, like, it's unclear, and it's not obvious to us exactly how angels interact. Though we also do read several times that sometimes we entertain angels unaware, meaning we don't realize that angels are in our midst. There are several places in the Old Testament where an angel showed up, but those people thought they were just people, and then God took them away, and then they realized they were an angel. Is it possible that that's what Paul is saying here, is that in the context of your corporate worship, as you seek the exaltation and the honor and the glory of God, that the way in which you interact, the way that God has called you to do it, you're being watched by angels who may come into your, time, into your congregation from time to time, into your midst from time to time. And so you have a responsibility to show 
even to the angels that you submit to the Father. Again, I don't know. Those are difficult. I, I see some value in both. There are some other interpretations as well. Uh, if you really want to, by all means, you can get into that. I just want you to realize that when we get to hard stuff, we're just not going to skip over them. But we do need to approach them with some humility and go, this is tough. This is hard. Okay, let's finish out here. So then he says, 13, judge for yourselves, right? So now after all of this explaining everything to them, now, now notice, remember, he said several times, sometimes sarcastically to the Corinthians, you're so wise and so learned, right? That was a big virtue to them was their knowledge. But Paul does say sometimes as they go throughout that you do have wisdom because it comes from God, so use that wisdom. So here, I think he's just trying to say the same thing. Look, I've, I've explained everything to you. Now, judge it for yourself. Is it proper for a wife to pray with God, to pray to God with her head uncovered? And then he goes to this issue of nature and says, does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears his hair long, it's a disgrace for him, but if a woman has long hair, it's for her glory? Again, going back to the creative order, going back to this is what was typical. I, I don't know exactly how to take this completely cultural, uh, but in my mind, there's when you read through um, the Song of Songs as an example, is woman's hair, Solomon talks about a lot in the sense of the glory that it brings, the uniqueness that it has. When you read through much of the Old Testament and as you get into the New Testament, you find out there were things for men like a Nazaretic vow, that if they took a Nazaretic vow, that they had to grow out their hair and it was this outward symbol of a very, it was countercultural, right? And so John the Baptist was considered, what, a wild, crazy man, right? They looked at him and went, he is not culturally acceptable because of these vows that he was taking, because of the call that he had on his lives. On, uh, sorry, on his life. And so I, I think that's what Paul's trying to get across here. Every culture is, is slightly different. There's different ways to dress. There's different ways that your hair is done, right? And again, we see this in Banff all over the place. Like I always ask, why do Australians not wear socks in the winter? I do not understand this. Anyway, I digress. Sorry. Uh, point being, right, is there's, there's uniquenesses all over the place. We get to see these things here, and so maybe it becomes a little bit more challenging for us to go, so, so what should define us, like, like what is a cultural normal thing in our time? And I mean, even if you think about it this way, is, is if you think back, even like, like music styles or things, there's like the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, kind of the 90s. And then I don't really know how to define anything beyond that. It all just gets mixed up and it starts to repeat and cycle so fast. Clothing, right? It's like we see these, these patterns that emerge. And the point being, as I think what Paul's trying to say, is look back to the Old Testament. Look back to reading and see how things were done in specifically maybe the Pentateuch. And look what was typical, what was normal, what was honoring to God. And then let's live in that way that honors God. Now again, remember, we're dealing with a church living in a polytheistic nation, worshiping temples, or sorry, worshiping at temples, going to the meat market, sacrificing all this food to idols, bringing it back. There's, there's massive difference now all of a sudden, no, I follow the one true God. And Paul's trying to say, you have to do that in unique ways. You have to stand out. You have to be different than the culture that you find yourselves in. Well, ours is different but I would say we are in the exact same boat. Because our culture is very ungodly. Our culture is very anti-Christian in a lot of senses. How are we as the church, how are we as people of Christ going to represent him to the nations in ways that people look at this and they go, they're different. Again, are we going to give up what we think we should be able to do in concern for what's a greater good, for what's more important, for what's better. This week I had opportunity to, to sit down over Zoom with our MLA of the area to ask, you know, what should the church or, or what should the government be doing differently? Anybody want to have that conversation right now with the government? 
anything you say, anything you say, Canada will be used against you, right? No, I'm just, but as I'm sitting there, I like was overwhelmed with this. I have all kinds of opinions, and I think the church has all kinds of rights, and, and I you get all worked up, right? And then as I'm headed into that meeting, right, we're praying the things that we should always pray, God, shut my mouth, right? Help me to hear from you. Help me to represent you well in this moment. And then it became this moment of, I'm not smart enough to have answers for those things. And so when she asked, I said, you know what? I don't have answers for that. All I know is that we're called as a church to pray for you. And so we're going to pray that you have wisdom and that you know the right decisions that ought to get made. And I think that conversation went very differently than she expected. I think we as a church are called to stand out and to be different. I don't think that. We know that. Sometimes we can read some difficult sections that are very obviously contextual and dealing with specific issues that, that we don't have today. But the same is true of us. Is we have all kinds of issues that the Bible doesn't speak directly to 2,000 years after it's written. But the principles are all still there. The principles of how to interpret the situations that we find ourselves are, that, that we are now in, are all here. We just have to seek hard enough and study hard enough and ask that God would open our minds and our hearts to see what he's saying to us. He finishes by saying, if anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. I think at any point when we start to elevate our own rights and we start to think we deserve we should get, it's already pretty indicative of where our heart's gone. We need to slow down. We need to back up. Yes, we still need to fight injustice. Absolutely. And sometimes the church has not done a great job of that in the past. Sometimes it has, right? Like everything, it's cyclical. But for us, we need to read this and we need to look and evaluate our own heart and go back to what Paul said. Is this going to bring honor and glory to God? And will it build up my Christian brothers and sisters and edify them? Or is this more just for me? That's the question that we should ask for everything. No matter what we do. I don't have all the answers to this text. Uh, but like I said, I'm happy uh, to discuss at length, whether in a summer sermon series uh, or whether just one-on-one -on -one to explain why I have interpreted these verses the way that I have. But truth be told, they are difficult. And so I'm not trying to tell you that I'm right. You need to just understand all this. I think we need to do the same thing that God said, or sorry, that Paul said. Just let's go to God. He gets to choose. And when we read things that we don't like, maybe the issue is in our hearts rather than the creator who wrote these things for us. Let's pray. God, admittedly, this is a difficult section and, and open to several different interpretations. But God, I pray that as we study these things, that we wouldn't approach them based on what we think is right, but that we would hold everything that we believe with an open hand to say, God, would you show me what is true and what is right and what is your word? God, when we read texts that are unique to certain context in certain cultures at certain times. May we not just ignore them and move past them and say, well, we don't have anything to learn here. But may we recognize that all these principles that we find all throughout here are, are going to help us in the unique situation that we find ourselves in. May we also not just assume that because something was written to somebody uh, 2,000 years ago that it applies exactly the same to us in this moment. May we be discerning. And may we, again, search for what you're trying to teach, the principles of how in which we are to work together as a church. And so as we talked about this morning, as we'll talk about over the next few Sundays, when we gather together, when we worship you, may we remember that this is not just me and you, but that this is us and you that we are the body of Christ and we are meant to care for one another. And as we worship together to honor one another, help us to not focus on us. Help us to not be selfish people. 
but help us to be a, a unified body that wants the exaltation and glory of Christ to be made known. So God, give us wisdom as we continue to read difficult passages. Help us to study hard, help us to seek truth, and help us to understand the very words that you were trying to teach to us. We love you. Amen. Again, if you would like to register for next Sunday, please do so. Um, it happens fast now with 15 people. I think Lori responded to my email in about four seconds. Like I hit send and I, my phone blinked. So uh, make sure you do register early if you'd like to come. We would love to have you with us. Uh, and we're looking forward to seeing you again next week. Have a wonderful week. And uh, do pray for our government because goodness knows they have a lose-lose job right now. So let's continue to uphold them. Have a great week.